that's something that's blindsided me for my whole career. I mean, it's so simple. It's so beautiful, though, that if we sit down and we look at the journey that the employee goes on day in, day out, doing the tasks that we expect them to do, how do we actually improve that? How do we make that more enjoyable, more engaging? And I think if we can crack that nut, then a lot of the problems that we're facing will disappear. So I'll use a... An example that you know is very real to experiences I had, which is, you know, acquiring four companies overnight, and all of a sudden now you have to bring four different cultures together. Kind of the same thing, right? Do you create a culture high performers want to be a part of? Do you bring energy and enthusiasm to work every day? Do you build relationships at all levels of the organization? I think we we make leadership this like, ooh, there's this secret to being a good leader and. Um, and we make it so much harder than it is. All right. Well, welcome back, team. And uh, great to have you here. As you can see, I'm in festive mood at the moment, um, gearing up for the holiday season, at least for the Western world. Uh, maybe the Eastern world is a little bit different, but for the Western world, we're gearing up for Christmas and that jolly old fella coming down the chimney. Um so I think depending on where you're sitting, it's either 11 or 12 days out from Christmas uh, when this comes comes live. So, uh, you know, best of greetings to everybody. And I think we're going to have a fun conversation today. I've got a great friend and guest joining me, Eric Harkins. Eric, welcome again to the ET Project. Great to have you here. Yeah, Wayne, thank you. I'm honored to be a two-time uh uh, guest, I guess, and uh, and happy holidays to everyone around the world. I feel a little underdressed, so I, I'm sorry I don't have my uh, uh, green and and red uh, sweater on. But but no, I, I yeah. Oh, and you're kind of, you're you're set. No, I, I, every time we talk, it's a fun, engaging conversation. I'm so impressed with the work that you're doing with the ET project, and uh, really excited for another fun conversation. So. Uh, looking forward to it as well. You know, I, I think given that we're in this holiday mood, um, maybe the theme that we, we play on is around how are we progressing towards a positive workplace culture? Uh, yeah. You know, both you and I are very focused in this direction, and I think this can be a, a, a great conversation piece for today. So if you're okay with that, we'll bounce around that topic. Um, yeah. Before we do it, though, Eric, what's Christmas look like for you and the family? Yeah, uh, you know, my my kids are sort of out of the uh, age where they're believing in things like Santa Claus. You know, my daughter's uh, 23, <laughs> my son is 20. So now we have kind of the, the next stage of the holidays, which is uh, for the last uh, three years. This will be the fourth year we've taken a trip as a family somewhere. Um uh, the ocean um, in North Carolina, the ocean in California. Uh, this year, uh, my wife and son and I are going to Park City, Utah to do some skiing. And mm. uh, my son will be snowboarding and my daughter and her fiance will be uh, celebrating with his family. So we're at that stage of, you know, we realize we don't get all the all the holidays with all the kids, but uh, fun to start having adult relationships with your uh, with your children. And I haven't skied in a few years, so I... Uh, I told my son day one, we're going to have to take it a little easy because uh, it's been a while, but I'm looking forward to it. You're going to be nice and sore. Now, yeah. uh, did, just for all the listeners out there, did I mishear you say that Santa Claus is no longer real? Did no, you, you misheard. I uh, I I misspoke and uh, and strike that from the podcast if you can. So. <laughs> no problem. You know, no. What, one thing I'm curious about for particularly for you in the States, right? You have Thanksgiving only a few weeks ago. How how does that impact the lead up into Christmas? Or is that like the trigger that gets you guys working towards I think, Christmas? I think it uh, it's the trigger. You know, I, I live in Minnesota in the United States for those listening from around the world. And, you know, growing up, I it seemed like we never had a Thanksgiving or, or December without snow. And, you know, we haven't had any snow. So it's all a a little harder for those of us in the cold weather climates to get into the spirit when uh, when the, the weather outside doesn't suggest that it's that time of year. But uh, love Thanksgiving. We had uh, we had our kids home and it's my favorite uh, meal to cook all year. And 
So I uh, I cooked a big bird and and we had a nice group over. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, very nice. Well, we're glad you enjoyed it. I'm I'm really looking forward to next year because uh, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later. But uh, I, I'm going to have the opportunity to do some facilitating over in in the states. So yeah. looking forward to catching up if we get that opportunity. So what what yeah. does uh, 2023 look like and if, if you were to summarize is there something that really stands out for you in yeah. this past year you know uh it, it's it's interesting i i had a i had a really cool opportunity to do my first international speaking event earlier this year hmm. in europe hmm. and uh, we had leaders from about 12 european countries uh that were present and I, right. I was sharing this with you earlier. You know, I had a, a, a leader come up to me after I spoke and said, you know what I really like about the title of your book? And I know we're going to talk about our books here. And I said, yeah. no. And she said, you know, you could have written it 20 years ago and you're going to be able to write it again in 20 years. And, you know, I don't want to do a bunch of shameless plugs for my book. But for those that aren't aware, you know, the title of that book that she was referencing is Great Leaders Make Sure Monday Morning Doesn't Suck. And uh, you've been so uh, supportive of the messaging. And and I guess where I'm going with that is in all of the speaking events that I did and all of the consulting I did and all of the workshops I led, you know, for as far as we've come on this topic of great leadership, we still have so much work to do. And I mm -hmm. kind of joke with people that, you know, someday this title isn't going to resonate with people. And unfortunately, right. I think that's probably not the case. But that's yes. my goal, you know, that we we are making progress. I think what I learned in 2023 is that the the younger generation of workers are not going to tolerate some of the bad leadership that you and I mm -hmm. growing up in our careers just assumed we had to deal with, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, whether you were getting screamed at or, you know, threatened to be fired or whatever. And that makes me happy. You know, I don't think either of my kids will tolerate some of the really bad leadership I had to tolerate. And I didn't have to, but I did. So I think from that standpoint, we're making some progress of, you know, one mm -hmm. of my favorite things to tell companies that I work with is, you know, the, the game has changed and make no mistake, you're no longer interviewing candidates. Mm -hmm. candidates, are inter candidates are interviewing you. Yes. And and so I think you and I are doing such similar work. And OK, so if that's the wave of the future, you better get ahead of it now or you're not going to have workers in 5, 10, 15 years because they're just simply not going to put up with bad leadership. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 such a powerful message. And unfortunately, I, I tend to agree with the lady you spoke with in this one. Um, you know, we're making progress, I think, but it's very slow. Yeah, uh, and and it has so many different uh, strains or direction to go with the topic. Um, but yeah, let's let's unpack that a little bit as we yeah. we go through our discussion. I mean, it, is there any um, positive direction or positive uh, areas you've seen occurring over the last twelve months that that gives you hope? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, to play off of what I just said, I mean, it, it gives me hope that employees are feeling more comfortable calling out the bad behavior. Now, right. uh, the responsibility of a leader is probably increased because, you know, that employee who's complaining and is a poor performing employee and shouldn't be part of the organization doesn't get a pass. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm talking mm -hmm. about high performers who yeah. say, hey, you don't need to talk to me that way. You don't need to be condescending. You don't need to be patronizing. Mm -hmm. I'm 40, 30, 50 years old. I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. I know what I'm doing. Let me do what you hired me to do. And so I think there's a movement where we'll see more of that. That gives yeah. me hope. But then that means, you know, that the CEOs out there that are listening to this um, have the same responsibility they've always had, but probably even more so in, in ensuring that they have the right leaders in their organization. And one of my yeah. favorite things to tell a CEO is, you know, CEOs have the easiest job in the company. And most of the CEOs will laugh and they're like, oh, really? What, why do you say that? And I always say, 
CEOs really do have the easiest job in the company because you only have one decision to make every day. Do I have the right people reporting to me? Mm -hmm. And if you're doing anything you don't think you should be doing, anything you don't want to be doing, anything that you feel like somebody else should be able to handle, then you don't have the right direct reports. And if you do, yeah. then guess what you get to do all day? Walk up and down the halls of your organization, high five employees and say, thank you. Wow. What yeah. would that look like? So I think we're moving in that direction, but you know, is this title still going to be relevant in 10 years? It probably is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's of course where uh, we're reporting to the AI uh, entities that <laughs> may, may not come around, but you know, from my side, I, I think what I've been encouraged by is I, I'm seeing a shift uh, in a lot of government organizations enforcing the well-being uh, yeah. message within industries. And uh, like I, I'm Australian and last year in Australia, or maybe this year, I can't remember exactly, um, they've introduced legislation now which has made it uh, a requirement of directors and companies to actually take well-being seriously and bring it into the business and make sure that it's in place and effective. So I, I'm encouraged by that. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of noise at least around the whole DEI, DEIB um, movement, the psychological safety. <sighs> I, I'm not seeing enough of it to know whether it's gaining traction. Hopefully yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, yes. There's there's a couple of areas. Um, and then from my side, I come out of the learning space. So um, <clears throat> I'm seeing more companies embrace the reskilling, upskilling um, ideals, um, ensuring that the employees have the skills that they need to do the job. So yeah. I think that's that's somehow encouraging as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a great a great point, and certainly the focus in in the United States, uh, as well as like you've said, in in lots of countries globally, uh, the the importance of you know being your whole self and mm -hmm. being able to bring your whole self to work, and you know maybe one unintended outcome of COVID was you know it forced everybody to think differently. Yes, period. whether that was how are we going to do this remote. Are we going back to an office? And we didn't have a choice. And, you know, it was the biggest no win challenge that corporate America has ever because what you want and what I want weren't necessarily the same things. And companies had to find that balance. And I mm -hmm. think it was probably good because it forced us to think a little bit differently like, okay, we did prove that we, we don't have to have that two o'clock in person meeting on Thursday. Because profit yes. is up and we haven't had that meeting in two years. And yeah. so how do we translate that to your point to each individual? But, you know, you and I always say the same thing and we have such similar messaging that at the end of the day, whether it's DEI, whether it's mental health awareness, workplace wellness, uh, whatever it might be, great leaders, you know, don't need a global pandemic to, to get yeah. to know their team at an individual level. And great yeah. leaders are going to say, I want the best people on my team. And, you know, I, I want people who are smarter than me, but that only works if I get to know them at an individual level. And so I do think that, um, you know, it, it might have loosened what used to be really restrictive ideas, which mm -hmm. I think does bleed into, well, that only works when you get to know your team at an individual level, because you might still want to go into an office five days a week and I might not. And yeah. can, can we manage both of those? But we don't know that until we sit down and have conversations. You know, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I'm having a, a conversation with a leader and they're asking me for my, you know, how would you handle this? What should I do? And how many times I've said, well, have you talked to the employee about it? <laughs> and they're like, well, no, not yet. I wanted to talk to you first. It's like, this stuff isn't that hard. Why don't you just sit down and talk to the employee? What would yeah. you like? Now, that doesn't mean you have to say yes. If it's not aligned yeah. with yeah. your business, yeah. if you can't do it for whatever reason, then tell them the why. But it, how, how do you know what you how you're going to handle something until you understand what the person you're talking to would like as a desired outcome? So 
Yeah, and I know you're very aligned with that uh, as well. And I, I think you're right. That is coming into the the whole health and wellness discussion, which is a which is a big one. So yeah, you, you mentioned a good point there. I mean, you, you get the opportunity to talk with a lot of leaders around the U.S. in particular, um, and for myself, I'm talking with different clients in in different countries. My observation is. You know, we're, we're making some inroads in specific areas. I, I deal a lot with uh, change initiatives. Yeah. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one of the things that I'm enjoying seeing and hearing about is leaders talking about bringing innovation as a prerequisite into change initiatives. Yeah. So they're inviting their people, their employees, to right. think about the, the change initiative as a framework. Yeah. And as they work through the change to think about how can we be more innovative in this yeah. broader concept uh, yeah. and the direction we're heading. So I think that's a that's a really encouraging sign. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, are you hearing anything from the people you're speaking with that sort of is suggesting we're heading in any particular direction for the future of business or the way we're leading? Like, is there yeah. any message? Yeah. yeah, I'd say there's a couple of themes. You know, one, and, and this isn't new, but certainly new in the last couple of decades, right? The the As technology improves, how does that change the look of, you know, yeah. whatever it might be? And, you know, I have a, a client that I, I worked with that, you know, has a, a warehouse and there's some technology that would, you know, allow robots to perform many of the same tasks, but the company is really kind of pausing because they're aware of the impact that would be to the team. You know, it right. means probably replacing some people. And, you know, anyone who's gone into any retail setting and used self-checkout or gone to a McDonald's where you don't even talk to somebody, you hit a kiosk and then you, your order's waiting for you. I mean, it is moving so fast and it's only going to move faster that I think, I think people are embracing it out of necessity, but I'm yes. glad there's still in a lot of the companies that I work with, the human element of, you know, how many humans do, or people do we really want to impact you know, mm -hmm. just for the sake of technology. And that's a tough, you know, that, that's a tough when you're a for-profit business. I think the right. other thing uh, that's just sort of new and people are still trying to understand it is, you know, how the world of AI is going to impact things, right? Recruiting, there's been so much research done around, you know, are we even talking to a real recruiter? Are we even talking to a real person? Um, I can't imagine you know, with a daughter who just graduated from college and a son who's in college, you know, being a college professor with the reality that students have this tool available and how do you manage that? So, you know, it's kind of the modern version of, well, what do you mean we don't need a notebook and pen? You're bringing some kind of computer into the classroom. What are you talking about? And it's just kind of today's version of, yeah, I mean, we have to you know, I, I love my favorite, one of my favorite sayings from one of my first bosses ever. So this would have been 30 years ago. He said, you know, Eric, if you're going to be successful as a leader, you got to learn how to ride the horse, the direction it's going. And I didn't have any idea what that meant when he said it. And now I'm like, wow, I get it. It's yeah. changing and it's changing. And you can, you know, decide not to embrace the change and become blockbuster, or you can figure out a way to embrace technology because, that's not going anywhere and it is going to impact your business probably in more positive ways than negative. So, And if you have the mindset of doing that, then it can be positive, right? It's, it's how you embrace it. If, yeah. if you resist it, you're going to look at it as a negative and that's, that's the outcome you're going to get. I, I suspect, you know, one, one of the great um, things I heard from a guest that I had on the podcast, actually two guests in a row, yeah. uh, what was an expression about you've heard you've heard the uh, customer journey right and people talking about touch points in the journey map well they've taken that concept and they've said well why aren't we doing that with our employees why are we so fixated on the customer and and making sure that every touch point they have is something to remember and exceeds expectations 
why yeah. can't we do the same with the employee? And I, yeah. I, you know, that's something that's blindsided me for my whole right. career. I mean, it's so simple. It's so beautiful, though, that if we sit down and we look at the journey that the employee goes on day in, day out, doing right. the tasks that we expect them to do, how do right. we actually improve that? How do we make that more enjoyable, more engaging? And I think if we can crack that nut, then yeah. a lot of the problems that we're facing will disappear. So I, yeah. I really <laughs> love that little uh, analogy. Um, so there, well, there's... Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go. Yeah. Well, I, you know, what I was thinking of when you were talking about that is it's just so true. And I always think about, you know, if you are a, let's just use a retail example. If you're a retailer, Mm -hmm. you know, thanks, Amazon. It's a lot harder to work in today's world than it used to be. But that aside, you know, if, if you have a customer facing business and, you know, shortage or theft is is a reality of your business, like in a retail setting, you know, imagine if, you know, if you if you took the cost of turnover, and that's one of the challenges my entire career is what's the real cost of turnover? And, you know, is it one week salary, a year's salary, whatever, you can figure out a formula that's probably pretty accurate, right? And if you took in any company the actual cost of turnover mm-hmm. and that was a theft related expense, the amount of work and attention that that theft would get, now we're going to lock this up. We're going to have extra security. We're going to have tags on our product. You know, we're going to focus because we have to control that shortage. And we don't, we still, in my opinion, don't look at employee turnover as, you know, the biggest cost to your business. And it, mm. and it likely is, right? It probably is, yeah. So the what, what you're talking about is that sort of recognition of, um, you know, the, the human piece and, you know, the, the, you lose that one high performer and yeah. you're now stuck with the four poor performers. It, it, there isn't really a price you can put on that because it's, it's 10 times what you probably think it is. So. Uh, absolutely. And back to your earlier point about, leaders sitting down having the conversation with their with their team and just finding out how how they're traveling you know what is their challenge today or in this role and yeah. and working with them to try and come up with those solutions will have yeah. huge impacts right and uh, another area that that I've seen grow in the last pro- probably in the last decade but more so since the pandemic is this cross-cultural team environment, which is now global, right? So um, <clears throat> this one of the leadership programs I'm delivering is to an IT group, a global IT group, and their teams consist of people sitting in China, in the US, in, in Spain, all around the world, and they come together at a fixed per- a fixed time during a day. So it means for some people it's going to be midnight, some people it's going to be early morning, pre-first coffee, some people it's middle of the day. They speak different languages, they have different cultures, they have different local agendas, yeah. and they're thrown together with the premise of working on a project, but that's pretty much the only guidelines. And so, you know, one of the things I'm seeing is leaders are starting to really grapple and struggle with this um, concept of how do we make this more effective? And I think the teams probably are the solution. They'll they'll give us more input and answers. But that's an area that I think is something we haven't, well, my my exposure to it, uh, I'm seeing companies haven't really addressed this to any great extent yet. Yeah. And, you know, this is why I love talking to you because you bring, you know, a, an entire career of a global perspective to any conversation like this. And so, you know, I wish I had more of a global. I've had some throughout my career, certainly uh, nothing in comparison to what you've had. So I, I might end up turning this back on you because I'm curious if uh, <laughs> how much it translates outside of the U.S. But on the topic you're talking about, so I'll use a an example that, you know, is very real to experiences I had, which is, you know, acquiring four companies overnight, and all of a sudden, now you have to bring four different cultures together, kind of the same thing, right? Yes. And I think, you know, in my 
in, in my work that I've done, what, what has become clear is part of the gap with that is that companies don't have a set of expectations for their leaders and or for their individual contributors, both mm. equally important to, you know, the, the opportunity. And yeah. you know, I, I talk about this tool lead and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. We covered it in last year's podcast at, at length, but you know, it, it's, it's in my book and it's eight questions to ask of the leaders in your company. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, at least when you are bringing in four cultures in the same language, English in the United States, whatever it might be, um, it makes it so much easier when you say, hey, here's what's important to us as a company. Not here's what's important to us in this building, which is different than what's important to us in this building. Or I'm wondering, does that translate for you to here's what's important to us as a company? Now, mm -hmm. it's no different in Hong Kong as it is in Singapore, as it is in Melbourne, as it is in London. These are the non-negotiables. There might be some translation things that need to happen, but the gap is, you know, we don't tell leaders how we want them to show up and start to build that culture. We tell leaders what their job is. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the first couple things in lead is, you know, do you create a culture high performers want to be a part of? Do you bring energy and enthusiasm to work every day? Do you build relationships at all levels of the organization? And all three of those don't happen unless you have individual conversations with your team. And mm -hmm. I think it becomes easier when you are genuine and authentic. I'll make one more comment and then I'd love to get your reaction to it. You know, my yeah. favorite thing to do when I was in a field role where I would travel to a dozen stores or a hundred stores was ask an employee, what's the worst part about working here? And they would always say, Oh, nothing. You know, I'm this guy from corporate, so everything's fine. And I'd say, no, on the days when you go home thinking you might quit, what happened that day? And when you start doing that, but you're doing it genuinely and authentically yeah. and listening, it's amazing to see what happens when people start telling you, because it's usually things you can fix. So I'm, I'm yeah. curious if you think everything I said relates to, you know, the work you do across countries globally, or are there, you know, enough of a cultural difference across countries that maybe that doesn't work? I, I'm genuinely curious about that. No, I think, you know, fundamentally, everything you said applies equally, in my experience anyway, in, in all countries that I've been involved with. Um, you know, one, one thing that came to mind while you were talking about that is... I think there's a golden opportunity for all companies is to get in at the right level with helping their their young leaders understand yeah. primarily what you what you just mentioned. So yeah. if, if if you think back and I think back to when we were first introduced into the leadership capacity, what was our guidance, our education, our um, expectations given to us by our senior teams, yeah. probably yeah. the answer, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but probably the answer is not too much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've told this story on other podcasts, and, and if you've heard my keynote, sometimes I tell this story, but I'll share it again that, you know, I was lucky because I graduated from college in the U.S., and I started my career at Target Corporation, you know, big company in the United States, large retailer, not global, but, you know, think about Walmart, but it's just not outside of the U.S. And uh, discount retailer, uh, I got my first job was in, in Target number one. It happened to be in Roseville, Minnesota. So, you know, I don't know how many stores Target has today, 1,500, couple thousand, first store ever. On my first day there, I meet one of my managers who's now reporting to me. She's a department manager. I'm the you know executive team leader. And she had been there since day one. And I believe it was like 32 years at that point. And she wow. was there on grand opening day. And she came up to me and she said, you're the new manager. And I said, yeah, hey, really nice to meet you. And she said, let me, let me tell you how this is going to work. She said, <laughs> I don't work for you. 
you work for me. I don't need you to tell me what to do because I've been doing it for 32 years. I need you to get me what I need when I tell you I need something. And if you make my life easier, things are going to go great. If you don't make my life easier, it's probably not going to work out too well for you here. And I remember that day going home saying, oh, my God, what's up with this person? And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my career because she was right. Yeah, we are hiring fully competent, high potential people. And then we tell them what to do. Yes. It's like, what the heck are we doing here? You just hired this person with 25 years of experience and you're going to tell them how to balance the um, P&L when they've been an accountant for 20 years? No, yeah. ask them what's the worst part about working here and then go fix it. Like yeah. one of the things you and I've talked about before is I think we we make leadership this like, ooh, there's this secret to being a good leader and um, and we make it so much harder than it is. Mm -hmm. Sit down, get to know people, let them get to know you. Don't let people show up who don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Tell your high performers that they're amazing. And it's almost that easy, right? I think there's two things that keep companies from having the culture they want to have. They let poor performers show up day after day after day, and they let bad leaders lead people. And I'm all about, let's keep it simple. I mm. really believe after 30 years and four years now of doing nothing but consulting inside of dozens of companies, if you just do those two things, you are 90% of the way there. So I yeah. love, your, love your thoughts to that. 100% um, yeah. on board with with what you said. W one thing I was just thinking about as well was um, if I think back about the leadership programs that I've developed myself, that I've attended as my career progressed, I can't recall ever having a module that introduced me to HR. <laughs> can't recall ever being in a program that was like HR 101 for new leaders yeah. and here, here's how you have a conversation with your team here's you know the basics of working with people um, yeah. maybe there's a lot of theories there's a lot of uh, right. psychoanalytical tools that we're introduced to but we, we maybe don't see it on the, the HR level we see it more as a, a leadership tool we don't really yeah. understand that, that's just uh, my yeah. observation but yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the case. No, that's uh, I, that's very interesting, and I think very true. And you know, I I I could spend the rest of the podcast, and I won't talking about uh, you know HR. I mean, I spent twenty of my twenty five years in HR, and and yeah. I always talk about how I I hate it when human resources is looked at as the internal affairs department of your company. You yeah. know, you don't really know what we're doing. You hate it when we're around. You think we're just there to catch you doing something wrong. And yeah. it's like well, the companies that view HR like that, that's probably what they have for HR. But the companies, that, the, you know, Jack Welch in the United States was kind of known for being one of the first people to really focus on talent as being one of the most critical components in your business. Mm -hmm. And he realized that nothing else really matters if we don't have the right people. So that that function that's really operations for people uh, better be a, a trusted business partner and an equal part of any leadership team as the COO or CFO or head of sales or head of marketing. And it's not that way in a lot of companies, but it is in some. And that's part of the journey I think you and I are both on too, is to you know, help understand that the people operations side truly is the most critical part of the business. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Hey, uh, I should have said earlier that congratulations, your, your book, that you were showing before, it's it's now number one bestseller on Amazon. So uh, fantastic news. Congratulations. Hit number one last year. It was a very humbling and very cool experience. And yeah, it's been uh, the whole experience. And, I, and you know, I want to hear about uh, your work and, and your, you know, publishing as well. It's, uh, you know, when, when I get an email from somebody saying, hey, thank you for writing the book or I learned something, uh, you know, it's just, it's a pretty cool and humbling experience. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it's been. Uh, where, it's, where is your cup, by the way? You, you have a you fantastic rule number three. Yeah, so here. <laughs> we'll, uh, 
Rule number yeah. three, I, I should have been drinking out of it. I think last time I was on with you, I was, but I'll hold it here. Uh, and yeah, listen, I, you know, I can't, I can't do a podcast without talking about rule number three. So thank you. So I have these three rules that I always talk about that I've learned kind of in my career. And, you know, rule number one, it's okay to have fun at work. Contrary to popular belief in some companies, it really is. I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, rule number two, poor performing employees don't quit voluntarily. We all wish they did, but they don't. And, you know, for any leader who's listening, you know, I want to take just a second. I want you to think about something, you know, when was the last time one of your poorest performing employees, somebody that you wanted out of the business, you know, came into your office and gave you their notice and said, mm. I'm out of here. Yeah. And now I want you to think about the last time somebody you didn't want to lose did the same thing. Right. And, and it's just one of the most critical parts of being a leader that you have to be willing to manage the poor performers in your business. And, and that leads to rule number three. And, and it's by far the most important rule I live by. Assholes are assholes. They don't change. And my favorite part of the conversation is people always ask for the definition of an asshole. And I, I say the same thing every time. I don't know what the definition is, but I know who they are in every company I ever worked in. And uh, people seem to respond to that with shaking heads and acknowledgement like you are. So thank you for uh, the plug for rule number three. I appreciate it. Uh, I have to say, Eric, I love I love your book. It's one of my all-time favorite business books. I, I, it, it's a quick read, as we've discussed before. It's, it's very to the point, uh, succinct. But you have so many wonderful antidotes in in the book, throughout the book. And uh, I, I can't remember the chapter now, but it's like a one-page chapter. In there. <laughs> I think, well, it has to be the shortest chapter ever published in a book because you can't get any shorter. But uh, yes, there is a chapter in the book, and I'll, I'll spoil it for everyone, but uh, it's chapter six. And the, the chapter title is, you know, Can a Bad Leader Create a Good Culture? Mm. And you turn the page and it says no. And then you're on the next chapter. And a funny story right after the book came out, a former boss of mine was one of the first people that called me and, and he had just read the book and he said, Hey, I wanted to say congrats. And oh, thank you. And he said, I got to be honest with you. When I read your book and I got to that chapter, I thought, Oh no, the publisher, the printers messed up. And then it hit me. Oh man, he did this on purpose. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, I will say a lot of people are like, oh, my God, I love chapter six. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I appreciate, listen, your support of the book and the message has been uh, has been very welcomed since we first met, uh, geez, well over a year ago now. And uh, uh, yeah, and and it's it is it's a quick read. Uh, most yeah. people finish the book in under two hours. And uh, hopefully there's, to your point, some some memorable takeaways to kind of take back to your company. So. Yeah, you you mentioned already the um, the methodology lead. I think that that's a really nice, simple ideal that we can we can use. You know, the eight points on on what to look for. I I want to digress a little bit, Eric, to yeah. talk about um, the goals. I think last we we spoke twelve months ago, right, on in the same format, and we were talking about goals for. 2023 and and one of them as you mentioned was having the opportunity to speak in, internationally you did that in lisbon congratulations yeah. thank you um, how's it been in 2023 from a business point of view um, gkg <clears throat> like how has everything running yeah it's been uh it's been great we just celebrated our four-year anniversary uh in november mm -hmm. which uh is hard for me to believe seems like i blinked and it's been four years uh, you know, we we kind of navigated through with our clients the whole COVID uh, transition that everybody uh, dealt with, um, and and it was a good year. You know, we the the speaking continued to kind of build and grow. You know, I I kind of have two different things that I spend my time on. So you reference GKG. So you know, I run a business GKG search and outplacement, and that is GKG get keep grow. So we do executive search and we do outplacement. Uh, I'd say the executive search work was sort of uh, a roller coaster. Uh, and I talked to a lot of search firms that kind of experienced the same thing. Mm. Part of the year was good. It was kind of quiet in Q, 
two first half of Q3, and then it, it kind of came back pretty strong in uh, back half of Q3 and Q4. But, right. uh, you know, certainly every chance I get to stand on stage and, and talk to a group of 100 or 200 or 300 leaders about this idea of what, what does it really mean when we talk about making sure Monday morning doesn't suck. But, you know, uh, similar goal for me for 2024 is 2023 that, you know, how do we continue to take this message outside of the United States? Because, you know, you've been very helpful with me that, you know, the term asshole means the same thing around the world. And, you know, this picture of somebody with their head down on the desk, you know, whether you're in uh, China or Europe or Australia, we all know someone who's looked like that on Monday morning. And, and a lot of the times it's been us that have felt that way. So, you know, I'm really excited about continuing to, you know, take a more global approach to the message and, you know, welcome your uh, your partnership and guidance in that journey too. So, Yeah, well, I, I guess now's as good a time as any to, to let the cat out of the bag about what we're talking about off, yeah. off uh, air about the potential for next year coming together somewhere and, and having some sort of leadership conference. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah. I think we're going to try and catch up in March and, and talk more about it. But, so yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah. yeah. Excited to have you uh, in the U.S. and look forward to uh, sitting down in uh, uh, in March, I guess. so. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. We've uh, we've also had quite a big year and, um, you know, anyone that's sort of following our social media will know that we've just opened our operations in Singapore. So we're awesome. now in four different, four different countries, which is fantastic. Um, I think yeah, back in... So Tell Sorry. tell everyone uh, you know who may not know the the countries that you operate in now. Yeah, so we 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 first set up in Hong Kong. Um, oh. That was back in 2019, and we had a, a fairly ambitious goal then of being established in ten countries within the first five years. Um, COVID delayed that for me because um, we sort of put that on hold for a couple of years. But now we're in we're in uh, Hong Kong, mainland China, uh, Australia, and, and just recently opened in Singapore. Yeah. Hopefully, um, all going according to plan. Next year we'll we'll be opening the doors in India. Uh, hopefully, around middle of middle of next year, and depending on how things are rolling, um, maybe by the end of next year in the UAE in Dubai. So yeah. that that's sort of our big hairy audacious uh, blueprint yeah. for where we're looking to go. But exciting journey, and um, what I really am happy about is you know the people that we've got within the team around these different locations. They're fantastic. They uh, they don't need me micromanaging. That's for sure. <laughs> and they don't want me micromanaging. So, <laughs> well. So. You know, you're you're very humble, which I, which I love about you, but you just said something that's so important in the conversation we're having that, you know, the best leaders out there get super excited about not being the smartest person in the room, right? Yeah. And, and get energy from the idea of having their backup on their team. They're not threatened by it. And they yes. love to say what you just said, like, you know, I joke about it in the book. I was very lucky in my career in the United States because over... A 25 year period, I was the head of HR at three different companies. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that much about HR. And I always say this, ask anyone who worked for me and they'll say, yeah, that guy doesn't know much about HR. But I have that first person in my mind at Target when I was 22 years old, telling me like, hey, this isn't about you knowing what to do, because I've been doing yep. it for 22 years, get mm -hmm. out of my way, go block and tackle for me. You know, and and so I give you a lot of credit, which is why your business is expanding. And, you know, I'll give you a shout out, even though it's your podcast that, you know, for anyone who doesn't follow uh, Wayne or the ET project, you need to start doing it because it's pretty impressive what he's done on a on a global scale. So I'm uh, always honored to even just have a conversation with you. So. I uh, appreciate that, Eric. You, you mentioned something there. I, I, um, I did a uh, a speech for one of the Indian Toastmaster groups last year. I'm just trying to remember. In, they were in North India anyway. And, and the topic was around the challenges that 20th century leaders have 
coming into the 21st century as leaders. And I, I think that's very much to your point that back in the 20th century, you know, when we became leaders, somewhere along the line overnight, and we've probably spoken about this before, somebody came in, snuck in, painted the big S on our chest, that we became superhuman when we were appointed, anointed as leaders. Right. And, um, you know, the 20th century leader tended to wear that as a badge of honour. And they thought they were superhuman. They had all the answers to every problem and they could do it themselves. Yeah. Um, the 21st century leader must have a totally different mindset to that. They have to be the collaborator um, yeah. from the heavens. They have to really realize that there's no way in the world that they can have all the answers in today's environment. Right. And they need that team. They need that collective genius around them with them to be able to survive. And I think that's that's my key message to everyone that, that I have as a client. You know, unless you're building a team like that, unless you have leaders that have that mindset, you're always going to be struggling. In, in yeah, today's I, world. boy, I think that is such a such a, a strong point. And and you're right. It's uh, it's a it's it is changing and evolving. And, you know, one of the kind of along those lines, one of the things I always talk about is, you know, titles don't change personalities, right? Mm. Or my other line is titles are really for books. And what I mean by that is, you know, yeah, being a VP or an SVP or a C-suite executive used to be the S on your chest. And, and I think the best leaders I ever worked with, uh, didn't act any differently because they were now an SVP. You know, mm -hmm. if if you're the person who walks down the hall and high fives people as a director and you get promoted to VP and stop doing it, why? Like your title didn't change who you are as a person. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it only gave you the ability to help others achieve their goals. And if we all thought, wow, what a powerful way to look at your role as a leader is it has nothing to do with what this all means for me. It's, you know, how many people can I impact in the organization yeah. by helping them achieve their goals? And the best leaders care as much about their people when they're not at work as when they are. And Absolutely. I've been saying that for 20 years, but to your point, you know, in the world we live in, we're all available all the time. We're a text away, even when we're on vacation. So that that's a gray area more than ever. So you might as well get to know your team at an individual level because, you know, yeah. we're all available all the time. So, I wonder. I wonder how many leaders are listening to us talking at the moment and thinking, "You guys are just so full of it. It's not like that in the real world. <laughs> how, how can we possibly live in a, this misguided?" But yeah. the reality is, if you do have that mindset, you are probably the the reason that you're living in that negative environment. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting question. You know, I try really hard in my keynote and in the book to be pretty practical and real, right? And not sort of rose-colored yeah. glasses and, and uh, oh, we can do this. But but I do think, uh, to your point, the ones who are saying, oh, these guys are, are full of it, my guess would be, you know, if they have 30 people in their organization, half of them are underperforming and they haven't done anything about it. And I say it all the time, like being a leader, whatever title you want to put on it, manager, you know, if you lead a team, yeah, you lead a team of high performers, there's no better job in the world than being a leader. Mm -hmm. If you lead a team of underperformers, it sucks. <laughs> like it's not fun at all, right? And <laughs> And I don't do sports analogies, but there's a ton of them that you could use around, you know, same players, new coach, six world titles, hadn't won a playoff game under this leader in 20 years. And they didn't change the team. They changed the leader. And, and that leader had the ability to get the most out of each individual. And, you know, I, I think what you're talking about, though, is, you know, part of the challenge that there's still a lot of leaders out there that hear this conversation and say they don't understand <laughs> Eric's been out of the game for four years. Wayne doesn't even get it. And, you know, I, you and I can say, okay, well, we agree to disagree on that one, I guess. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had a, a guest from, from Greece actually, who introduced me to the term, you may know the term coming out of the HR world, but the dark triads. And they're talking about the narcissist, the Machiavellianist, and the, 
the psychopaths, right? And, yeah. you know, at, the more I look back on leaders that I engaged with during my career, you know, yeah. the more I saw, not in everybody, but to a yeah. large extent, those types of leaders operating, um, particularly during the, the 80s and the 90s, last yeah. last century. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that as people listen to us, they're yeah. really getting this message that you yeah. need to be a different leader today than what may be yeah. the mentor that you have was yeah. themselves as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, take the good, leave the bad from your career. And, you know, yeah. somewhere in the book, I talk about the fact that I was lucky because I worked for some good leaders, but I was yeah. a lot luckier because I worked for some really bad ones too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you learn from both, but you certainly learn what not to do uh, as much as you do, you know, learn how to, how to move forward. But you're right. I mean, what worked, there's that great book, you know, what got you here won't get you there. And it's yeah. a great book for any company that's doubled or tripled in size. And all of a sudden they're wrestling with that. I think that's the same message for, Hey, what worked in 85 is not going to work in 2025. And yeah. what worked in 1995 isn't working today. And quite frankly, what worked in 2005 probably isn't working today. And that's back to that. Are you embracing, are you riding the horse the direction it's going? Because right. what motivates kids who are graduating from college today are not the same things that motivated us when we graduated from college. And, you know, you have to be aware of, you know, what's important to each individual more than ever, I think. So, yeah. Well, one of the big challenges I do see for leaders is um, a lot of the younger generation that, that I've engaged with often have what seems to be unrealistic expectations yes. for the organization structure. So yeah. they, they come into a job, they expect to be promoted within the first 12 months, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that, that's a real challenge, I feel, for leaders today to be able to keep them engaged but give them the reality of the world that they're working in and, and not mislead them. And I yeah. think there's a risk that they do more damage by trying to just be yeah. a pacifying leader to say, yeah. look, you know, do the right, put your head down, do the right thing, you'll 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 make it. Sometimes you have to give the the team the real yeah. truths as hard as that may be. And I know you talk about this in, in your book as well. Yeah. Uh, so you're just so spot on with that. And, you know, it goes back to this. Listen, nobody likes having tough conversations. Right. And I yeah. talk about that a lot. It's, but but there's two things I want to talk about. One back to, and then I'll, I'll answer what you were just talking about. Or I'll, I'll speak to what you were just talking about. But the conversation we were just having about people that are listening, saying, oh, forget it, you know, whatever. I think a really important thing to distinguish is that Everything we've talked about on this podcast and all the work you and I do does not mean you can't fire people. We're not mm. saying you have to be this nice person, whatever that word means to you. You know, you are going to fire people. You are going to have to eliminate positions. You are going to have to make tough business decisions. My spin on it is you can do all those things and you don't have to be an asshole, right? Mm. And the leaders who start just treating that underperformer like shit every day so that they'll quit no sit down and have the honest conversation so to yeah. to come to what we were just talking about i think that's it it's you know what you might not be able to do what they want to do you know hey i just joined and i think i should get a raise because i showed up on time my every day for my first 30 days yeah. well there's the one leader that will that will hear that and and let's use a real example. You know, I've been here six months and I think I should get promoted. I think that's yeah. very real in today's world. And yes. instead of sitting down saying, hey, Wayne, it's unlikely that you're going to get promoted, but here's what I'm going to commit to as your leader. We're going to do this. I'm going to get you in front of the senior leadership team. You're showing mm -hmm. a ton of promise. I do think you're a high potential person. It's only been six months, but you have my commitment to help you achieve your goals. Or... Yeah the leader that won't have that, you know, goes home and tells their spouse or significant other, this kid thinks he's going to get promoted and what yeah. an idiot.
but they never <laughs> sit down and actually have the conversation saying, hey, you can get promoted, but it's probably not going to happen. Now, I will tell you, uh, I have one client, and I actually respect this. In the search process, they they tell people, and and I, you know, typically at the VP level, if you're joining the organization, that we're going to ask you to perform for two years in this mm. role before you're promoted. Now, that might be a little extreme on the other end of the spectrum, but I think if we all set some guidelines of, hey, your first six months is you know, figuring out where the bathrooms are. Uh, yeah. But after your first year, we'll start to really talk about what kind of career pathing may exist for, for you know, this role. Um, at least there's an expectation there. And if somebody leaves because they want to get promoted in three months, then I think you have to be okay with that as a company. I'd rather have you be okay with that as a company than just not have the conversation with the employee because then they leave and you're wondering why you didn't even yeah. you know, have the chance to save them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm hundred percent on board with with that direction. I think you know transparency from the very beginning doesn't always play in your favor, but it right. does in the long term. Um, yeah. So I think there's no doubt in my mind, at least that's that's the right way to go. Hey, we're we're getting close yeah. to the end. But always I'm goes fast. What... It always goes <laughs> fast. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm curious what uh, what's your plans next year, apart from what we've spoken about? Anything we haven't touched on that you're thinking about? You know, uh, other than, you know, trying to continue to, to, to find leaders like you that are, you know, doing this on a global scale and, and partnering and saying, hey, you know, there's so much synergy and similarity to these messages. How can we help more people? You know, yeah. I think you'll see me putting a little more focus on uh, the key, the speaking and and building sort of the brand around the book. It's been awesome. It's been a big part of what I do. Uh, but I I want to do a little bit more of that next year, and and I want to continue to grow on a, on an international scale. So other than that, like I kind of joked about in the beginning, you know, good news for the book, I guess. But the title is still very relevant today, and uh, and I think it's going to be in in twenty twenty four and. And that gives you and I both a lot to look forward to in terms of, you know, helping every company out there change their culture one Monday morning at a time. And uh, it there, can be there's, done. No, there's no sequel in the pipeline, Eric. There's... You know, uh, it's funny. I, I, you know, there's the old saying, if, if you want to write a book, tell people you're writing a book and then they'll, you know, hold you accountable to it. I will say this. I, I would like to write book number two. I have the shell of some chapters. Um hmm. I just don't want to put a timeline on it, but uh, I wouldn't bet against book number two coming out next year. So how about that? <laughs> Perfect. I, I love it. I, I also uh, have a book in my mind. Uh, I'm looking for a co-author at the moment. So who knows? We, we hey. probably won't be 2024, but uh, we might be close. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I look forward to that and and really genuinely uh, thank you for the work you do on a global scale and uh, happy holidays to uh, to you and your whole team and your family and uh, really is an honor to be able to be on the ET Project podcast a second time. So, Yeah, fantastic. Always a pleasure, Eric. I look forward yeah. to catching up in a few months and uh, yeah. Yeah, um, see what the future may hold. Sounds good. <laughs> and to all our listeners, uh, you know, happy holidays. Hope you enjoy the festive season for those that, that celebrate it. I know we have a large following in India, uh, so you probably don't follow it as, as we do in the West. But to everyone listening, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We'll talk yeah. again in 2024. Um, but, yeah, all the best. And thank you, Eric. Yeah. It's been wonderful yeah. having the opportunity to bring you on the show again. So. Much always, uh, always a fun conversation and yeah, happy holidays to everyone out there. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.